just highlight um, to the to the to the, um, the idea of maybe including something around the need for a cultural impact assessment on alternative options, just as a consideration. Just be around Wording. with the words. Yep. Yeah. Got an update. Right. Has it? Yeah, we'll just have a look at three and see if that doesn't, or G3, if that doesn't meet your needs, have a little look and I'm sure we can come back to that. Um, Councillor Quacks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Rick, thank you very much for the hard work uh, on behalf of the, that you've done on behalf of the people of Auckland, you and your group. And um, I just want to just clarify something in my own mind, but do in any way do the number of TEUs relate directly to the population of Auckland? Um, they, they do in the sense that uh, there's an important relationship as you go through time. The interesting assessment is when you start to compare ports in terms of the, of the number of TEUs per person within the kind of catchment area for the port or the distribution area for the port. And the numbers are all over the place. Um, you know, and, and so that, that's why it's, it's sort of useful to think about it if, you, if you assume that the trade is going to stay the same. But you just run into this fundamental uncertainty that how would you make an assumption over more than 50 years that the trade is going to remain the same? Thanks. Um, just in terms of um, some of the sections of this report, and, and I understand the, you know, the long-term nature of the, of the focus of the group, uh, obviously, as you'll be aware, the, it's the shorter-term focus that's probably uh, exercising everyone's mind. I just wondered within you know, the general discussions, particularly as it goes to multi-cargo and uh, cr cruise vessels, it, there's a number of comments made there um, in respect of what what appears on the face of it anyway to be options or, or other ways of doing things and that's kind of implicit in some of our recommendations. Was there much detail or, or overseas experience drawn upon in respect of options with, with those two things, the, the cargo and the cruise ships? Uh, it hasn't been, I know it hasn't been captured in the recommendations, but is there sufficient possibilities there to, to make um, some of these you know, concerns uh, with respect of the short term uh, you know, obsolete or, or able to be met in some way? Did, did that come through the discussions given some of the expertise that was available? I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, certainly there was international um, experience brought to the study and, and there was an international port marine kind of consultant specialist attached to the AY study who um, would have would have dealt with those issues and we also had access to you know very good access to the, to the ports information perhaps not as much as a consultant might have liked all the time but um, um, but but certainly got a lot of input from from the port um, but we were not trying to solve that problem we were trying to solve another problem which was to understand what the demand and the supply were going to be, not the configuration. Um, I guess just in terms of you know where where the where the council sits, um, that meshing up of the of the of the long term, which was your focus, and the short term, um, sort of provides possibilities that that are that are helpful in terms of decisions that are going to be reached n now, though, doesn't it? I mean, it's. Uh, it's fine to have that long-term focus, but there's things that we're considering that information has been passed in one form or other mm. that will inform our decisions. I, I guess I'm just just wondering, other than Googling things, what the ability is to 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 research that expertise, given some of the you know contrary or on the face of it um, differences of uh, interpretation or emphasis that are now being put forward. Well, I think the important the, the important thing is that. Um, Given that you've got two, two options on the table for the short term and neither of them are really very satisfactory, yeah. and given that um, there's going to be a need to resolve that under, with a lot of scrutiny, I imagine, you really need to do something fairly fundamental that tries to identify a better option that, that meets 
the medium term or the short and medium term requirements um, and um, meets the aspirations of many Aucklanders who would prefer not to go there. But I think the important thing from our point of view is that, is that over, the, over the near term we need to ensure that the port is able to operate with balanced growth. So the, the, the thing we don't want to do is find ourselves in a position where we've got you know, a port with some, with some you know, 15, 20, 30, whatever it is, years of headroom that ends up being constrained by one particular bottleneck that you can't unlock. And so that's the reason why we have to find a solution to this berth length issue around the cruise and multi-cargo. And I think we could have spent quite a bit of time on that. It would have been very contentious. Um, but we were really working on our, on our main uh, activity, which was to develop the, the, the long-term um, strategy. Yeah. It's, I think there's a really subtle line there, Councillor Watson, that, that you've identified, and I think that's the complexity that we're trying to grapple with. Um, Councillor Lee. Yes, thank you, and thank you for the hard work. It must have been an interesting experience. Um, essentially, uh, you're saying that uh, presently the number of uh, containers uh, going through or coming through ports of Auckland is about a, a, a million TEUs, um, and that there is capacity according to ports um, employing uh, different technology and so on for three million. Is that be right? Okay, so, um, and that to, to move the port um, would cost, to relocate the port would cost about five billion. Um, it, does that relocated port include rail and road links? Yes, it includes the landside transport all up, connections. Yeah. All up package. Yeah, and that's actually one of the big differences between the Minicar and the, um, and the Firth of Thames options, obviously, because the, the connection links are longer and more challenging um, in the face of Thames? It, it, it's not entirely a question of uh, a lands person approach, is it? If you talk to anyone who's been to sea, um, that they um, are very dubious about any uh, possible port in the Manukau because of the Manukau bar, which in terms of navigation um, is extremely challenging, um, especially for bigger ships. So that, that, that has influenced you? Yes, um, well, really in two layers, I suppose. Uh, you're absolutely right. As soon as you raise the question of the Manukau, well, you know, why would you put a port there? Um, the, the initial consulting uh, work that was done, um, in effect, designed a, a channel and some engineering around the bar to make it accessible. Given the, that we knew that that was going to be con contentious, we, uh, we had that peer reviewed. As a result of the peer review, the consultant changed the design, um, which increased the costs, uh, but didn't change the, the sort of order, the rank ordering of the alternatives. Um, and, and at the end, um, I guess the conclusion was that it looked as if you could construct a, a navigable, effective, safe harbour there. Um, you know, ongoing dredging, engineering and so on, not unusual from the point of view of, of uh, harbour management. However, um, both the, the, the uh, consultant and the peer review said that that needed to be subject to more detailed assessment. I think when you consider the longer time horizons and you know, potential changes in, in, in climate and so on, you, uh, you know, that needs to be done with a very um, a careful and, and, and specialist technical uh, lens, and that wasn't a lens that was available to us in the in the time and scope of the study. Thank you. And just just one more question. Um, in terms of of port expansion, um, which is always assumed to be into the harbour, um, and obviously the reason why you carried out the study is uh, cannot be divorced from the uh, public opposition to further extension. Uh, was undergrounding Key Street considered in any way? Or in other words, expanding the port inland, was that considered in any way? Um, it, it did come up and there were, there were some um, options considered, um, but, but the, um, the, the, the view I think was that with the investment possibilities on the container side, 
um, the big issue was was the big the big issue was really getting the birth length, and and expanding it in in towards the city doesn't solve the birth length problem. Um, doesn't solve the birth the birth length problem. Um, yeah, the problem keeps changes from from storage problems to birthing problems. Wherever uh, have you found that? Well. Uh, <laughs> Yes, and I think it takes a little while to to, un, to untangle that. We, we actually have, you know, three kinds of constraints on the port. One is the land area, which is which is essentially driven by, um, in 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 our port, it's driven by the, the storage of containers and the technology you use to handle them. And then the second area of constraint is in the birth length, which which interestingly in our port is is currently on the on the cruise ships and on the multi cargo. So we've got different constraints constraints kind of on the t two different major activities there. And then the third area is, is your land side uh, connections. And we didn't do design work on the land side connections. Uh, I, I, yeah, uh, I suppose the, your work is over, but I, 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 I just, my advice in terms of, of cruise ship birth length is it's not a major. Um, um, if the Queen Mary can birth alongside in the Port of Auckland, there's not many ships longer than that, um, which a dolphin couldn't solve. Sorry, and the fact of the matter is, the beauty of cruise ships is that they can actually sit out in the harbour. Um, but anyway, um, it's, it's a really an investment business case option. If you want to bring cruise ships alongside and spend a huge amount of money and put up with public opposition, then you have to have a really good business case to prove it, and that would be interesting to see. Thank you anyway. Thank you, Councillor Lee, and I think the Councillor Darby and the Mayor's recommendations pick up some of those issues. I've got Councillor Brewer, Member Taipiri, and Councillor <coughs> Wood, and then I think we should move to the recommendations. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. My um, issue is pr possibly um, one for you as Chair to address uh, and or officers. In our, uh, I point uh, members to uh, our Agenda 1, Six nine, page 169. In our original agenda, we were given uh, two options uh, as recommendations to choose either or, <coughs> option one or option two. Uh, without explanation, we're now heading down option two. Uh, and I suppose I just want to table uh, my concern uh, that option one has been discarded at this point without discussion. Um, that is to refer the consensus working group recommendations and report uh, and consultants in, uh, consultants report to the incoming council full stop. Um, I suppose my question is around some explanation uh, as to why uh, we've discarded option one and instead uh, eight days before eight days before nominations opening, uh, we are going down a process of sending the chief executive off to do some very specific work uh, around investigating a location, a preferred location, when I would argue, Madam Chair, that there might just be a mayoral, uh, the next mayor might not see such work or incoming council and or incoming council as an absolute priority. And so I would rather see uh, the CWG and the EY reports uh, lie on the table, be given to the incoming council unvarnished and for the chief executive and the executive team to pick up the work if it is requested at that point rather than they inherit uh, directions that we're giving them as I said that we don't have that we don't have a mandate for uh, that will be a big part of this upcoming local body elections and so um, if it is an alternative if it is an alternative amendment I certainly would like to see uh, refer the consensus working group recommendation if and supporting consultants to the incoming council, full stop, and for G uh, to, uh, I will certainly be, won't be supporting all that work uh, starting from today uh, without the mandate of an incoming mayor or incoming council. Are you moving? Yeah. Well, <coughs> just, just hang on, you can't have two recommendations on at once. This is simply, there's one option or the other. No one's taken option one off the, off the table. Option two's been moved. If that's not voted, if that's voted down, then you vote on option one. So I'm sorry, Councillor Brewer, there's no political conspiracy there. <coughs> it simply is just as it is. Well, no, you've, you've, no, you've adopted option two by including everything below. Gee, that is option two. Option one is to refer it to the incoming council, full oh. stop. 
And so do not say that this is incorporating both options. No, this is very much starting the work today. And I'm saying let's go back to option one, full but stop. Don't, so all I'm saying from the Chair, Councillor, is if, you, if <coughs> option two is voted down, then one can go back to option one, which simply leaves it lying on the table for the incoming council. So, mm. Well, my question, Madam Chair, is why has option one uh, been discarded uh, without, without discussion? Why, wh why, who, who has made that decision? Uh, no, no one's made the decision. Councillor Darby Option the one or option moved. two. I can see we can be circular here. 